Be real. How much in undergrad did you learn about how televised violence causes violence in young kids? You didn't learn anything about it? Me neither. And I got a bachelor's in psychology that I'm very proud of. Here it is. But how much did you learn about Kohlberg's moral development, Piaget's, and the James Lang theory of emotion? Hopefully, at least a little bit. The psych social section is famous for giving you passages that seem unrelated and like you never learned anything about this topic, but then they'll ask you really niche questions about basic sciences that you should know. Passage five of the AAMC sample test is the perfect example of this. So let's go ahead and get into it. So let's get into this thing and start flowcharting it. Researchers conducted a study, study one, to explore whether there are immediate effects of televised violence on children's aggression levels. So we're looking at TV violence on children's aggression. I like to write down my variables in psych because a lot of those research methods and hypothesis kind of questions will pop up. Boys and girls from two different age groups, ages five to six years and eight to nine years, that's probably foreshadowing. Um, if you're not familiar with what that is, definitely go check out our video on it. Um, but it's when we kind of predict what questions they're going to ask based on things that they've given in the passage. And that looks kind of sus. You know, anything in parentheses is often foreshadowing. Okay, um, different age groups were randomly assigned to the experimental group or the control group. The experimental group watched a six minute video of violent television scenes containing an action sequence that showed a chase, two fistfights, two shootings, and a knifing. Uh, the scenes were selected from nationally televised programs. The control group spent six minutes working on a coloring book. Okay, so we got our groups. We got the group who's watching a knifing and then the ones who are coloring. We also have five to six and eight to nine year olds. So the groups kind of look like this. Afterwards, the experimenters told the participants that they would be part of a game that another child was playing in a different room. By pushing different bus buttons, each participant could either help or hurt the other child. Uh, the researchers counted the number of times each participant chose to help or hurt the child. The results are shown in figure one. So let's do a little bit of figure interpretation. Uh, figure one, always start out with the caption, uh, average number of hurt button hits by condition, and then we kind of got our groups up here in the key. Um, it looks like the gray is the violent program, and across the board, they have more average number of hurt button hits. So they are hurting the other children in the game more often. It looks like um, the hypothesis is going to be supported here that violent, you know, ex violence exposure kind of has immediate effects on how violent kids are towards other kids. We also see that the researchers have broken it down into boys versus girls within these eight and nine year old groups. So we've gone from four groups now to eight different groups. So looking at this figure anymore, I could get a lot more information out of it. But from a big picture standpoint, I see that there's just a huge difference between the violent program versus the coloring book groups and um, the average number of hurt button hits that they had. So that's my main takeaway. If I need anything else, I will come back to this figure. In study two, okay, so we're on a different study, uh, researchers studied the way children played with toys after exposure to violence. The participants were from the same age groups as in study one. After watching the violent program or working on the coloring book, the participants were taken to a playroom with aggressive toys, for example, guns or knives, and non-aggressive toys, for example, dolls or building blocks. Their behavior was videotaped and presented to raiders who counted each time the participant in the video engaged in aggressive play, for example, playing with aggressive toys or assaulting the dolls. It does not tell us the results of this experiment, um, so likely if we get a question on this, it's probably going to be about experimental method rather than the results. Going straight into the questions, number 21 says, considering the stage that the participants are in according to Kohlberg's theory of moral development, basic science there, what changes to the study design are most likely to result in decreased aggression? So let's take this question in chronological order. What stage of moral development, according to Kohlberg's theory, are these participants in? They would likely be in the pre-conventional morality stage. Typically, children are in this stage before about age nine, though that, that can be a little bit loose. What characterizes this stage of morality is that children are basically just following rules to avoid punishment. Um, it's all in their own self-interest. They don't really care about the greater good or anything yet. All they care about is kind of avoiding punishment or getting some kind of reward. So now the second part of the question is saying, okay, then if these kids are in pre-conventional morality stage, what do we need to do to decrease aggression? 
I would think if we want these kids to be more moral and decrease aggression, that's kind of like the same thing in this question stem, then we would need to show them that their behaviors, if they are aggressive, are going to have a punishment. Either that or show some reward for displaying altruistic behaviors or whatever you want to say. Let's go to the answer choices. A says lengthening the videos the participants viewed to one hour with a 10 minute play break in between each six minute segment. Ooh, that would take forever to get through that video. I think this is pretty unrelated to morality as a whole. Um, it doesn't really provide any overt reward or punishment for behavior. I don't like it. B says the addition of a segment to the violent video that portrays the actors being put in prison for their illegal violent behaviors. Prison's definitely a punishment that is relatable to kids. I mean, think about time out. That's basically like prison for a kid. And so that, that would probably be helpful in providing some sort of punishment um, outcome for these kids. I like it. It goes along with the stage of morality that they're in and that it provides a strict punishment for a behavior and therefore they're going to not be as aggressive so that they don't have uh, that punishment bestowed upon them. C says the addition of a segment to the violent video that portrays the negative impact of violence on the victims. So the stage of morality that these kids are in is pre-conventional. And in, in the pre-conventional stage, um, again, it's all about self-interest. It's all about avoiding punishment or getting some sort of reward. And so you don't care about the victims when you're six years old. All you care about is what's going to happen to yourself. So this would probably be referencing conventional or post-conventional uh, stages of morality. D, having the participants work on an interactive task with other children before and after watching the video. Again, not related to morality. B is our best answer here. 22 says, which change to the design of study one would test the hypothesis that frustration causes aggression? I notice a strong word here that we don't see very often in psych social, and that's cause. And so we got to have some pretty strong um, experimental design here. So what is the design of study one? It's trying to see whether um, watching aggression um, in TV or whatever causes aggression in these children. But what this question stem is asking, how can we change study one to make it uh, frustration that's causing aggression? So when it's written out like this, you can pretty easily see that we need to change this first variable here from viewing aggression to frustration. A says keeping the independent variable in study one with the addition of telling the participants that the child they are helping or hurting is the same sex as they are or a member of the opposite sex. So what is the independent variable in study one? It is whether or not, actually there were, there were quite a few like groups, but it was whether or not they viewed aggression or if they spent that same time uh, drawing in a coloring book. So answer choice A wants to keep that the same, but also like later on in the study, tell them that um, the, the member that they are hurting is of the opposite sex or the same sex. That's irrelevant. Sex is not in question here. Um, so that's not a good answer choice. B says replacing the independent variable in study one with placing an attractive toy in the room and telling half of the participants that they are not allowed to play with this toy. I do a lot of babysitting and I know that this would so easily cause frustration in a child if you told them that they couldn't play with this really fun looking toy. Um, so if we replace the independent variable, which is viewing aggression, uh, with that frustrating uh, scenario, that would certainly give us this experimental design here. I like that answer choice. C says using the same experimental method, but also assessing the participant's frustration level before and after they are given the opportunity to help or hurt the other child. So I think this would almost be opposite. This would be testing whether or not viewing aggression caused frustration. That would be like if you measured frustration levels before they started hurting the child or helping the child. I think it would also test whether or not helping or hurting another child cause frustration. So we're, we're all talking about blah, 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 causing frustration, but that's not what we're looking for. The question stems asking for something that states that frustration would cause aggression. So this is not a good answer choice. D, using the same experimental method, but also taking measures of physiological arousal to ensure that the experimental and control groups differ on these measures. Uh, first off, I think that that would be a bad thing to do because um, we want the physiological arousal to be the same within, like between the groups. But overall, it doesn't have anything to do with frustration. Physiological arousal can be a number of different emotions or related to a number of different emotions. So that's not right. B is our best answer here. 
23, how would the James Lang theory of emotion, basic science, explain the aggressive emotions experienced by the participants in the experimental condition? Participants experience physiological arousal from watching violent programs and... So you got to keep your head on straight with these theory of emotion questions because they will all um, kind of word their answer choices in a very specific way that will lead you to either James Lang, Cannon Bard, or Schachter Singer. Whenever you are looking for James Lang theory of emotion, think physiological arousal leading to emotion. I believe that James Lang theory of emotion, it's kind of the most simple, the most basic. I think it was like the first one that was kind of like thought of or theorized. So you won't see words like interpret. You won't see anything happening at the same time. It is physiological arousal and then it is the emotion. It is I am sweating and so I am fearful. James Lang theory kind of sucks because if you think about it, like I could be sweating for multiple reasons or I could be crying because I'm happy. You know, crying doesn't always lead to sad. So there's not enough physiological arousal kind of characteristics that can point to all the different emotions that humans can experience. Throw that little caveat in there for any of you who are James Lang haters like me. So we got the physiological arousal part already mentioned in the question stem. All that we need in the answer choice is for it to say, and then they had an emotion. A, this arousal is followed by aggressive emotions. Totally. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. It's very James Langey. B, they simultaneously experience aggressive emotions. So simultaneously, that will be cannon barred every time. Anything that mentions same time or simultaneous, cannon barred. C, they interpret their arousal. I'm already interpreting is Schachter Singer. Any kind of cognitive appraisal, interpretation, that's Schachter Singer. D, this leads to fight or flight responses that are perceived as aggressive emotions. I'm not sure what they're trying to point to here, if they're trying to point to a specific theory or if they're just trying to kind of throw some ish in there and hopefully it makes you bite. Um, But A is just a, a solid James Lang answer. 24, helping to instill norms and values related to violence and violent behavior. Media exposure is an aspect of which process? You can simplify this down to what process helps instill norms and values? Socialization. If you don't know what any of these other words mean, I would definitely recommend that you learn them, but none of them have to do with instilling norms and values. 25, the two age groups that participated in study one are most likely to perform differently in which tasks developed by Piaget? King Piaget, he's so commonly tested on the psychosocial section. If you're not familiar with his um, theory of cognitive development, definitely be really familiar with it because you'll get questions like this all the time and they're easy money if you know. So there's two different age groups. The question tells us that. And we know that there are five to six and then eight to nine. So this question simplified down is what's the difference uh, according to Piaget between these age groups? Breaking down Piaget's stages, we know that zero to two is our sensory motor. 3 to 7 is our pre-operational, 8 to 11 is concrete operational, and 12 plus is formal operational. So the 5 to 6 year olds are going to be in the pre-op stage, and the 8 to 9 year olds are going to be in the concrete op stage. So now this question is, what's the difference between pre-operational and concrete operational? Another thing that you should know related to PAJs is not just the stages um, and their age ranges and their names, but also some milestones that the kids hit, um, according to Piaget, before they move into a different uh, stage. And the big one here that is going to be relevant is um, between pre-operational and concrete operational, children have to master um, conservation. So I'm going to be looking for an answer choice that basically says that the eight to nine year olds um, understand conservation and that the five to six year olds do not understand conservation. If you're not familiar with what conservation is, totally go watch a Khan Academy video on it. But it's about like that experiment where you can pour water into a tall glass and the kids will say that it's more water than the fat short glass, even though it's the same volume. A says looking for an object that the researcher hides from the participant's sight. So that's going to be pointing to object permanence, which is the milestone between sensory motor and preoperational. All these kids should be able to know that an object hidden from one's sight still exists. B, using accommodation to acquire knowledge about novel experiences. I don't know off the top of my head um, if this is even like a Piaget theory thing. 
Um, it might be, and I, I don't really know. I'm looking for conservation specifically. That's like a, a heavily tested um, milestone on the MCAT. So that's what I'm looking for. But reg- I'll put a maybe beside it because I, gen- I genuinely don't know. C, deciding whether a given quantity of liquid changes if it is poured from a narrow container to a wide container. So this is what I was talking about. This is like the most common way to test conservation of matter. And the two age ranges will differ in whether or not they are able to do this. So I like C. D, reasoning about how the end result of a story might have changed if the main character had acted differently. This kind of sounds like um, some of the stuff that that older kids are able to do. So like a formal operational kind of level. Uh, Formal operational is all about being able to um, theorize or being able to think about novel experiences before they've happened, thinking about the future, thinking about consequences, that kind of stuff. So these kids won't be able to do that. Um, Therefore, C is going to be our best answer. Okay, so you see how they didn't ask you anything about violence, but they pulled all these basic sciences out almost like exclusively from just the age ranges that the kids were in or the research methods side of it, like the experimental methods. For psych social, always stay super solid on your basic sciences and look for those key words like we did for the theory of emotion question. I hope that passage walkthrough helped y'all. I'll see you in the next one.